So our second uh, presentation is from Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who is Professor of Epidemiology and Director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity. And he's going to speak on social inequalities and mental health. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've gone down into the brain. I want to come up out of the brain and look at society. Let's start with the social distribution of mental illness by income quintile in England. It shows a social gradient. Most of you by now will know that it's very dangerous to catch the underground east because life expectancy drops for each stop you go east, so better off to go west. Um, well, we see the same issue with mental illness, the social gradient. Um, I think the frequency seems to have gone down. It was about weekly that the gene for X was reported in the newspapers. I thought bipolar disorder, the genetic basis has been discovered so many times. It's, we can now explain about 200% of the variants. Um, and the Guardian said clinical depression is a debilitating condition, the causes of which are still largely unknown. When I chaired the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, one of the priority public health conditions that I identified was mental illness. And we convened a group at WHO to look at the worldwide evidence, debilitating condition, cause of which are largely unknown. And this group said, low socioeconomic position, the level of evidence, very convincing. Low education, very convincing. Unemployment and underemployment, very convincing. And then food insecurity, gender inequity, low income, strong. I don't think it is actually largely unknown. I think we know a great deal about the social determinants of mental illness. And not just what we conventionally think of as mental illness. I'm particularly delighted with this for a meta reason, because two leading economists, Anne Case and Angus Deaton, have got converted to social determinants of health. They were conventional economists. They all thought that health causes your income. And then they discovered that, aha, when drugs started affecting whites in America, it was no longer a criminal issue, it became a medical issue. As long as it was blacks, you lock them up. But when it's whites, you wring your hands and say, oh my God, mortality's going up for non-Hispanic whites. And the so-called deaths of despair, which Anne Case and Angus Deaton labeled, deaths due to poisonings, suicide, and alcohol. And the lower the education, the higher the rise. So BA or higher and lower than BA, huge inequality. And the rapid change means this is not some genetic disorder. It's changing with the nature of social change. And when we look at what's happened to well-being between 1995-6, 2011 by socioeconomic status percentile, the bottom tenth negative affect went up, but it didn't for the people at the top. Positive affect went down, but it didn't for the people at the top. So the gradient got steeper. Life satisfaction went down, psychological well-being went down. I'm not saying these are the key things, but they fit with these deaths of despair going up. And we've known about deaths of despair in the UK for a long time. Glasgow has high mortality. If you compare Glasgow with Liverpool and Manchester, three post-industrial cities with similar levels of poverty and inequality, Mortality is higher in Glasgow than in Liverpool and Manchester. And the causes, drug-related poisonings, alcohol, suicide, and violent deaths. Deaths of despair have been alive and kicking in Glasgow for a long time before they were sorted out in the US. And the mind is, I've 
not the gateway, but an important gateway by which social circumstances affect health and health equity. Effects on mental illness and well-being, and I say to my psychiatric colleagues, you have to address social determinants of mental health. And I say to my public health colleagues, you have to look at the social determinants of mental illness, not just physical illness. And psychosocial pathways to physical illness, behaviors and stress pathways. I talk about the causes of the causes. We know that smoking and obesity and alcohol are causes of ill health. Well, what are the causes of the causes, the social gradient? And in my English review, the so-called Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, we're now doing a 10-year update on the February 2020, on the 10-year anniversary, we're going to publish a 10 years on review. And I had six domains of recommendations. And I would argue that they apply to mental illness as they do to physical illness. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions. Number four is really radical. In a rich society, everybody should have enough money to live on. Actually, feeding your children is quite a good thing to be able to do. Five is healthy and sustainable places to live and work and taking a social determinist approach to prevention. If we look at early life, I've been emphasizing the research that people do on adverse child experiences, but Poverty sets the framework. An international comparison where child poverty is defined as living in a household at less than 60% median income. In Denmark, 9% of children are growing up in poverty. Iceland, Norway, Finland, 9, 10, 11% Korea. The UK, 19.7%. The US, they love child poverty. 29% just below Mexico. Are they not rich enough to do something about child poverty? The real obscenity is not what that orange nightmare does with porn stars, but no one's talking about child poverty. That's the real obscenity. And that, we know, increases the likelihood of children suffering adverse child experiences. It relates to the quality of early child development. We know that half, time the li half of the lifetime risk of mental illness, excluding dementia, has its onset by age 14. So what happens in early childhood is key. And trying to explain the deaths of despair, this is again from UNICEF, Neonatal mortality, suicide, ages 0 to 19, mental health, 11 to 15, drunkenness, and teenage fertility. And they rank all the rich countries. And there's the US near the bottom. I think it starts early and works through the life course. Child poverty, adverse child experiences, poor adolescent mental health and mental well-being and then continues we know that the likelihood that the current generation in the US will have better income than their parents has plummeted from 90% to 50% it used to be 90% likelihood that this generation would have better income than their parents it's now 50-50 Things have got worse right through the life course. But there's much we can do about it. I've got interested recently in the health of indigenous peoples in different parts of the world. Australia, on the Human Development Index, ranks two or three. If indigenous Australians were treated as a separate country, they would rank 115. So in 
just about the richest, most advanced country in the world, you've got this. And I was taken to a place in Western Sydney, and these stories of child removal, isolation, depression, and suicide. The people who set up this place, the shed, and it is a shed, told me that the conventional wisdom was that men get depressed because they won't talk about their feelings. They said the approach they took was that Aboriginal men get depressed and suicidal because they're unemployed, because they're homeless, because they've had their children taken away from them, because they're cast out of the system. So they try and deal with the fact of their homelessness, the fact of their unemployment. They have a lawyer whose main job is trying to keep the children with the family. The default system of the child care service in Australia is that Aboriginal parents are incompetent. The question is not if you take the children away, but when. And Aboriginal groups are trying to change this. Now, that's at a micro level, but we need interventions at a macro level. I came across this. A well-being approach can be described as enabling people to have the capabilities they need to lead lives of purpose, balance, and meaning for them. And I thought, we might have said that. <coughs> Amartya Sen? Could be. It was the New Zealand Ministry of Finance. Wow. That is the credo of the New Zealand Treasury. Not how do we get faster GDP growth, but how do we enable people to have the capabilities they need to lead lives of purpose, balance, and meaning for them. That will improve their mental health. That will improve their physical health. And that will make a difference to health equity. We really can do this. So, uh, as ever, incredibly uh, thought-provoking. And if some really quick-thinking people have a question, uh, there's, we've one here and we've one here. Yeah, hi, Dave Curtis. I, I mean, I get that poverty and equity makes people miserable and is bad for their well-being, and that's why I support Jeremy Corbyn. But I'm not so convinced that what I'd, I'd call this mental health. I mean, um, you know, I feel it's a, a job for society to make a better society. But what I'm see, it's maybe one slide you have there on what I'd call a mental illness, say, severe major depression. And in our clinics, we're used to seeing people have major depression who don't have any of these problems. And I think it's a problem if we medicalise a response to social adversity. Well, I don't think there was much that I said that was medicalising. I was talking much about social interventions. And as always with these social trends, it's not universal. I mean, rich people can commit suicide. It's not... Um, it's not all or none, but as you saw in the US data, the rise in suicide, the rise in drug poisonings is much steeper in people of lower education, and the lower the education, the faster the rise. So it's not ineluctable that poor or uneducated get problems and the rich are immune, but we do see these definite trends. Okay. All right. You do a great job in drawing attention to these but you're sitting in a room full of psychiatrists and psychologists who rarely approach the media to talk about these things. And I just wondered, I mean, I, this London has the highest incidence of psychosis, which is consequent of many of these sort of factors that you talked about. Do you have an idea why at least physicians have begun to talk about these things with psychiatrists and psychologists seem to be so wimpish and are never campaigning to do something about the state of our inner cities? I think you should ask all your colleagues that question <laughs> rather than ask me that question. I mean, my approach to what's going on at the moment is that we in health have a unique position because whether you like Jeremy Corbyn or it's hard to imagine that you could like those other guys, but, <laughs> but you know, whoever it is, um, 
I don't want to get involved in that. I want to get involved in what are the steps we could take to improve health and reduce inequalities. And as I've tried to say, mental illness and mental health are fundamental to that. And so we ought to be part of that discussion. And it's not saying that what you were talking about is irrelevant, it's vital. And it's, although I was slightly rude about the genetic work, but that's vital too. Understanding fundamental mechanisms and doing interventions, I'm all for it. But I also am of the view that what we are doing in looking at health, and I know I've heard you speak, and you know, you, you, we're on the same page here, um, that it's vital. We're saying something fundamental about the nature of society, and it's going wrong. I mean, I was on the BBC a couple of weeks ago talking about the life expectancy crisis, the fact that life expectancy has stopped improving mm. and inequalities are getting bigger. And mental illness is an important part of that. And we have to be out there saying that. I'm going to stop you with one really short question and a really short answer. <laughs> um, yeah, um, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I was struck by uh, your findings from America that it wasn't till white people started suffering from deaths of despair that actually the research kicked in. And I'm interested in systemic racism and its effects on mental health and how often that is not articulated. I'm going to ask the indulgence of the chair to give a slightly longer answer. That um, I mean, I firstly, although they pointed to the rise of mortality in non-Hispanic whites, blacks have higher mortality than whites. And in fact, more recently, mortality started to go up in black Americans as well. And let me just talk about one issue, imprisonment. We know the figures vary, but about half, if not more, of people in prison have a diagnosed mental illness. Now, I'm sure being locked up is not good for your mental health, but, and blacks are overwhelmingly more likely to be imprisoned than whites. I think we need to put all of that together and look at how we can prevent mental illness in children. And I think racism, dealing with racism is part of it. It's not helped by this horrible man talking about so going back to where drift he came into from. politics. But I think it's absolutely <laughs> fundamental um, to deal with the racial question as well. Thanks, Michael, very much.